business was going well. I went to my first company event. It was about six months after I joined, went to a conference and they do the big announcement of the top 25 sellers, top 25 recruiters. And I'm just this little person in this big sea of people. And at this point, kind of rewinding at this point in my marriage, it, it was not looking great mm. at all. And so I remember sitting in this crowd watching these women and realizing for the first time that there was no stereotype. Like they all look different, different ethnicities, different walks of life, different experiences, different personalities. And I remember just watching them. And I've not had many moments like this in life, but truly it was one of those like, it wasn't audible, but it almost kind of was like I was sitting in the crowd and I remember thinking that could never be me. And it was this moment where I feel like the Lord just kind of spoke to me and was like, why not? Why not you? And I don't think I would have ever, and this is why I'm big on in-person events, as we've discussed, because I wouldn't have ever experienced that had I not been in that room. Yeah. Welcome to the Excellence Project. My name is Eric Worre, and today we have a network marketing leader, Kristen Bance, who's going to talk to you about her journey from single mom to high levels of, of network marketing success, how she did it, how she navigated all the doubts, fears, concerns, worries, and reinvented herself, found different values in what she could bring to the marketplace and has exhibited that. I think you're going to enjoy it. So with no further ado, let's jump into my conversation with Kristen Vance. Kristen. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So uh, I'm glad you're here. And as people might not know, you, we just finished a mastermind event here in Las Vegas. Yeah. You stayed an extra day, which I appreciate that you and your husband. Um, I want to know, I, I, mean, I know generally your story. I know you're successful in network marketing. I, mm -hmm. I know you, you do well. Uh, but I don't know where you came from, really. So can you walk me back and just kind of start at the beginning yeah. and tell me tell me how this journey started? Yeah. So my parents, my dad had, uh, he was a firefighter growing up. So he enlisted when he was about 20 years old. And neither of my parents were very entrepreneurial. Um, but my dad always kind of just knew exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a firefighter. Went to school to be a firefighter, ended up getting his master's, bachelor's degree. Uh, my mother, in order just to help provide, because they didn't make an awful lot, uh, she went to nursing school but never finished because he was military. They traveled. So she ended up taking on little loose end jobs. Is it military or firefighter? So he was in the military. He military enlisted in first. the military. Yep. Uh, enlisted I see, I see. in Air Force and then became a firefighter in the Air Force. Got it. Okay. And so, you know, enlisted. They weren't making a whole lot. So my mom would pick up loose jobs here and there. She worked at Target, Verizon, you know, just to help make ends meet. So I can't say that the entrepreneurial spirit ran in my family, but they were hard workers. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's interesting because I was always a little bit envious of those people who knew exactly what they wanted to do. I want to be a firefighter. I'm going to go be a firefighter. You know, I want to be a nurse. I'm going to be a nurse. I always just wanted to be a stay home mom. I was like, I want to get married. I want to have lots of kids. You know, I want to be involved in church, PTA, all the things. And you'll learn in my story as we talk in this podcast, it did not turn out that way. Mm. But that was always my dream. People would ask me, like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I'm not really a career driven person. I just want to be a mom. And then when I was about 17, and I wish I knew the defining moment, but when I was about 17 years old, I had this dream aspirations to be a public speaker. I wanted to be on stage. I thought maybe it would be ministry. Hmm. I was like, I'm going to be the next Joyce Myers. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but at the time I questioned it because I didn't really have a story to tell just yet. You know, my whole upbringing was, it was a great upbringing. I had a great childhood. So I was like, what story do I have to tell? What's my testimony? And then the Lord eventually gave me one. Right. <laughs> really yeah, good story. One, one will show up. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, growing up again, I just didn't, I wasn't really career driven. Where, where did you grow up? I grew up in San Angelo, Texas, okay. West Texas. Got it. So West Texas. So yeah. growing up, you want to have this, uh, American dream, white picket fence, <laughs> yep. the the whole thing. Yeah. Um, have this idea of being a speaker, don't want to know what your story is. Right. So you, when you get out of high school, 
did you go to college? Did I did. So I think I just I felt like because that was everybody the, else was. Doing that's it. the next thing to do, right? Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. graduate, you go to college. So I went to college. I changed my major several times. I went in as journalism. I thought, hey, I like to write. We'll do journalism. And then I love kids. Let's do early childhood education. I love fitness. Let's do kinesiology. And then I landed on psychology and actually never really used my degree. Because <laughs> that's like a long thing to be like uh, licensed as a psychologist, right? So it like is. 10 years or something? It is. And you really have to go for your master's. And I think, I mean, I was 17 when I went to college. So, I mean, I look back, I'm like, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was just trying to figure it out. I knew I loved people. So I thought maybe I'll get into counseling. But I ended up um, getting married to my first husband right out of college, graduated, mm -hmm. got married. He was military as well, moved away. So that's in a large part why I never used my degree, because we ended up moving a bunch. And so I kind of went on that journey of being that being know, the mom, being the mom, not a mom yet. But right. Or being, you know, being the wife. Yeah. Being the wife, taking care of the house, doing all the military wife things. So okay. that's kind of where so I was at. That, that's in your early 20s. Early 20s. Yes. All right. So that's whatever it is. Yeah. So and then what happens? So this is kind of where the Lord begins to give me a testimony. Mm. So I you know, one of the whole white picket fence, the kids, all the things. And, you know, life was life was good up until this point. And then I quickly learned that things weren't always what they seemed. And I began to hit adversity. What does um, that mean? So my my ex-husband ended up struggling with addiction, mm. severe addiction. And so that was a ongoing battle for several years. Drugs, alcohol, what was it? Um, mainly drugs mm. prescription. Mm. And so that was something that we worked through and tried to work through in battle and rehabs and all this stuff for several years. Like painkillers and stuff? Or? Uh, yeah, mainly pain meds. Yeah. Those yeah. Do, once, once people get on those, it's kind of hard to yeah. get out, right? Yeah. So, and, and so my eyes were just kind of open to, I, I, I would say from my point of view, I don't think I grew up sheltered, but looking back, I think I think I was to some mm -hmm. degree. And so it was just a whole new world for me to try to navigate. And I didn't know anybody that had struggled with addiction. That wasn't something that I had ever dealt with. What was it like being a spouse of an addict? Uh, you know, I, I don't know what that experience is like. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, if people talk about their different experiences, I have friends and family that have had addiction mm -hmm. problems, but this yeah. side is interesting so it's it's hard because i mean anybody who's a loved one of yours whether it's a spouse or a child i have friends now that have their children are struggling with addiction which i will say this i i think in sharing my story over the years you realize you're not so much alone there's a lot of people going through this whether it's i mean i've got friends that have struggled with addiction mm -hmm. you know and their spouses and their kids and that when i began to share my story i began to feel less alone and isolated in that. But at the time I thought, nobody's dealing with this. Like I'm the only one dealing with something like this. Um, but it's hard, it's hard to watch anybody you love go through something like that because you see the very best in them. You want the very best for them. And, you know, you see them, you know, for lack of a better phrase, kind of throwing away their life and you just want to fix it. And I'm a fixer by nature. You know, I'm the, I've always been the peacemaker in my family, the one who wants to make sure everybody's okay and fix things. And so I think that was hard because I thought I can take this on. I thought I, I can fix this, you know, I can help him. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I quickly realized it's gotta be something they want for themselves. And that was a battle for me internally of, I can't fix this. I have to give this over to the Lord. I can pray. I can be there. I can support, but ultimately I can't. How long did this last? Um, several years, several years, probably okay. three years. Was there some sort of tipping point, turning point? As far as just you know, it, it, he didn't. Did he stay in addiction? Did he? Did he beat it? Did so? Then you kind of fast forward. So we ended up having a child in 2015, December okay. 2015. She's my oldest, mm -hmm. and then your world really kind of changes when you have a child. It's you look at things so differently. It's not just you're looking out for yourself. You know, right. you're looking out for this little person who's relying on you. And that's when that's when it became tough because you realize you're not just 
trying to help this person, you're also now trying to protect this person. And I think that's when things really began to kind of change and shift for me. And this is about the time when network marketing entered the picture okay. for me. So again, I was, and I had little loose end jobs. I mean, I liked fitness, so I did personal training for a little bit. I fixed up furniture. I had a little antique shop. You know, I was doing little things. I was not making a lot of money by any means. So about the time we were in a season where rehabs were in the picture, um, lots of adversity. And I always said I would never be in network marketing. Why? I think I just, for some reason, never thought that I would be good at it. I was mm. like, okay, you take the words direct and sales. I'm not direct. I mean, I have become more direct as the years went on. And I had not really had any experience in sales. I had kind of those experiences where the, the hey girl messages. And I was like, that is, I'm not doing that. Right. I'm not doing that. So I was, I was against it to some degree. Um, but watched a friend of mine. This was about the time 2000, 2017. I joined December of 2016. This is about the time people were doing lives. And I watched her doing her makeup on live. And I don't even know that I did it for the money. I think there was part of me that thought, okay, things aren't looking so great in my marriage at this point. So maybe I should start bringing in a little money. But I think for me, it was just, I wanted something for myself. You know, yes, I was taking care of this baby and and I loved having part of my identity and being a mom, but not my sole identity in that. Mm. And so I was more open to it. And I told her, I said, hey, I'm interested in learning more. I'm not going to build. I'm not going to do all those things. I just, you know, want to use the products. And so that's kind of when I got into network marketing because I was going through this rough time in my life. And so I, you, you, you were framing it to your this person that you met. Mm -hmm. uh, that you're just going to be a customer. Mm -hmm. You're just going to just use it and see yeah. what happened. But in the back of your mind, you're like, maybe this could be a plan B. You just weren't yeah. willing to like admit that. And I think that's most people. I think most people really want it. I think they do. I just think there's that self-doubt. There's mm -hmm. that fear of failure. So then we like, we kind of water it down and go, well, it's okay if it doesn't, you know, maybe I won't team build, but everybody deep down, I think longs for that success. Sure. I just didn't have that belief in myself at that point. So for me, I pitched it to her as this is just something for me. You know, I love the products. So why not get a good deal on the products? Yeah. So, I mean, the lesson in that is if somebody says, you know, hey, I'm not interested in building. Um, that's not always the truth. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. I would. Agree. It, it, but l let them let them let them have their path. Yeah. If she would have pushed you. Yeah. It, it probably would have turned you off. Right. And she didn't push me. She didn't push me at all. And she was like, Hey, that's okay. What, however you want to run this business, it's up to you. That's the freedom of this industry. And so I did. Um, and then I started, I'll never forget. So day one I joined and I thought, I don't know if I'm gonna be any good at this. I had this lady reach out to me to try to sell her products and which I really wasn't interested in just being honest. But I turned around and I said, oh, hey, that's great. I actually just joined a company too. She said, oh, great, what company? So we start talking. She ends up that night buying $300 of products from me. And then it was kind of like, oh, okay, that wasn't so bad. Like all I did was have this conversation with her. And then about six weeks in, again, wasn't team building. I had a lady reach out, didn't really know her that well, but she had been following a little bit of what I was doing on Facebook. And she said, hey, is there an opportunity to join? And I was like, yes, yes, there is. So I always kind of look at those as my little God winks because I feel like those were the things that gave me that boost of confidence to go, okay, this isn't so bad. Maybe I can do Just this. Breathe. Yeah, like started to give me confidence in the business that I don't actually have to be direct and sell anything. Mm -hmm. I just have to connect with people and have conversation. So kind of fast forward, the business was doing well. I wouldn't say I was a, a major success or anything, but it was steady. And I was You're just selling at this point, just selling at this and point. And you added, added a, a person here or there, added, added a couple people to the team really by luck. <laughs> and so business was going well. I went to my first company event. It was about six months after I joined, went to a conference and they do the big announcement of the top 25 sellers, top 25 recruiters. And I'm just this little person in this big sea of people. And at this point, kind of rewinding at this point in my marriage, it, it was not looking great mm. at all. 
And so I remember sitting in this crowd watching these women and realizing for the first time that there was no stereotype. Like they all look different different ethnicities, different walks of life, different experiences, different personalities. And I remember just watching them. And I've not had many moments like this in life, but truly it was one of those, like, it wasn't audible, but it almost kind of was like, I was sitting in the crowd and I remember thinking that could never be me. And it was this moment where I feel like the Lord just kind of spoke to me and was like, why not? Why not you? And I don't think I would have ever, and this is why I'm big on in-person events, as we've discussed, because I wouldn't have ever experienced that had I not been in that room. Yeah. And big, big decisions are made. At yeah. In our business. 100%. Yeah. And so it was this moment of kind of like do or die, like inspiration kind of turned into desperation because I realized like life is not going in the direction I thought it was. So I either need to make something of this business and I had already seen little, you know, like like said, the God winks and the little, you know, smidgets of success. And so I walked away from that conference going, okay, like we're doing this because either I make this work, which I, I really felt at this point it could, or I go get a big girl job, mm -hmm. <laughs> a real job, but then I would have to put my daughter in daycare. Mm -hmm. Well, then there goes that dream of being a stay home mom. Mm -hmm. So I walked away from that conference and that's kind of where the pivot of everything happened for me. So you went home from that car. Where was the conference by the way? Uh, Austin, Texas. Okay. So it wasn't too far. No, it wasn't far. So you get home and you're like, all right, I'm going to go do this. Yeah. And the marriage is all wonky. Yeah. At that point. Mm -hmm. um, and your daughter? My daughter. Your yeah. daughter is you know, a couple years old? Uh, she's a baby. Just a baby. Baby at this All right. Point. So. You got to figure out how you're going to keep a roof over the head and do all that yeah. stuff. He's not maybe as stable yeah. uh, as he would need to be for his own life, let alone right. taking care of you. So, yeah, you know, what's funny is. And I feel for people who get to get themselves in a situation where they find that they have to compromise on what they want in their life because they need security. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's like, what am I going to do? Yeah. Uh, you know, he's, he does this and he does this and he does this, but uh, at least I have a place to stay. Yeah. At least I have food in the refrigerator, you know, at least I have clothes on my back. Yeah. So I'll hang in there for now. Right. Yeah. Um, when you're, when, but and, and it's funny because had things been going okay, you probably wouldn't have been open yeah. to an opportunity. You probably wouldn't even thought about exploring yeah. something entrepreneurial. Yeah. And I really think that's what set my story and network marketing apart and where the success came from. Because again, it wasn't just I'm motivated, I'm inspired. It's like, I'm kind of desperate here. Mm, mm. Like, and I feel like desperation can move you much further than the inspiration can. And so some people treat this business and that's the beauty of it. You can make it what you want, but a lot of people, it's a hobby mm -hmm. or I feel like doing it today. So I'm going to do it. For me, it was like, there was days I did not feel like getting up. I did not feel like pressing that live button. I was like, by golly, I'm doing this because I need to make a living for myself and my daughter. So really that's where the consistency, the discipline came in because it wasn't a, I want to, it's I need to. Yeah. But in that process, I will say even being a need, it turned into a passion. It did turn into something I wanted to do Yeah. because during this time, and I, I attest a lot of my success to this too, I was struggling. I remember picking up a Bible study. It was called Discerning the Voice of God by Priscilla Schreier because I was like, I'm hearing all these voices, my own, the world, you know, I need to figure out what I'm supposed to do and I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. And so I picked up this Bible study and Again, I, I knew this had to be from the Lord because this wasn't something I wanted to do. But I remember feeling this urge to do the Bible study online. And I was like, no, no, no. You know, you got you got business. Then you have your, you know, like it's mm -hmm. separated. But for me, it was kind of this push to I can't separate my faith from anything I do. Business, family, it's all integrated. So I ended up doing this Bible study online, live videos. I said, hey, I'm doing this Bible study. If anybody wants to get this book, let's do it together. 
and I would hop on live every week and we would just, I would just answer the questions and chat with people. And during this time, all these women, and I wasn't, I wasn't sharing all my dirty laundry on live. I mean, I was sharing that, Hey, I'm walking through some adversity right now. I was just being vulnerable. I think there's a balance in that. Mm -hmm. And all these women just started messaging me like, Hey, I'm struggling with this, or my spouse is struggling with this. And it connected me, connected me with so many people during that time. And I still look back and those women that I connected with during that season of life are still some of my most loyal customers today. Hmm. Because I wasn't trying to go on live and be picture perfect because I struggled with that previously. I was just like, hey, this is my life, good and bad. Where, where was the struggle of, of feeling like you needed to be perfect? I think that's always been <laughs> really a part of my life. Yeah. You're all put together today. Everything's all fancy. Yeah. I mean, I even remember my very first live. I thought I had to look a certain way, sound a certain way. I had notes taped to the back of my mirror, making sure I said everything right. I think some of it, because I look back, my parents were definitely not that way. I mean, they were very much be authentic, be yourself. I think a lot of it might have been the things I was involved in. I was involved in dance. I did kind of pageants here and there. And I think when you get around certain communities, and not that it's it's a bad thing, but you just, you start to care more about the way you look and you sound. Mm. And so, and I've just always been a perfectionist. And then you let go of that though. You started to Over let time. go of that and, and just saying, you know what? There's a time and place, I'm yeah. gonna, but I'm going to, I'm going to, pull the curtain back yeah. and, and I'm going to be a real person. And It's still, it's still a struggle. I yeah. mean, even preparing for this podcast today, I was like, I love to be prepared. Like I want to know what questions so I can answer everything just right. Yep. And so the Lord keeps putting me. We didn't in have that. No, I sure didn't. I even messaged your assistant. I'm like, is the question? She said, no, we're just talking. Mm -hmm. And so I have to fight that constantly, but I think I've been put in positions often to challenge me in that just like this one just like mastermind mm -hmm. because i'm learning more and more that it's the authenticity that carries you further in this business sure. than the people, people feel like they know you yeah yeah and so i look back on that time i'm very thankful for that time obviously it was a very hard time in my life but i'm very thankful i learned a lot my relationship with the lord drew close i was connecting with people and then of course things did take a turn and the marriage ended up ending and I was out of when did that happen? Um, this was in 2000, 2017. Okay. 2017, 2018. Um, and so at this point And and when you when you came back from your conference, you said, you know, I'm gonna go do this, I'm gonna go live, I'm gonna do all this stuff. Um uh, how did did success show up right away? Were you starting to build a team once you made this decision? I gotta go build this thing. It, it kind of did, yeah. it kind of did. I, I, so I started, so I was in the makeup business and I started doing these late night lives. So my schedule was real wonky because I would be mom all day. Mm -hmm. I'd put my daughter down around eight thirty nine o'clock and I'd hit that live button and I would do these hour long makeup live. every single night, every single night I was doing these makeup lives and just chatting with people and putting on makeup. And there, so, can you tell me how, um, what was the process of getting customers and signing up distributors in if somebody were, is listening to this like if you, you tell me if i just go live and i do like <laughs> something in my normal day and we just chat uh that what are people magically dm you and want to join do you have to ask yeah. for the order uh, i mean how, how does that I think process things have work? evolved i mean back then i do feel like lives were really being pushed in the algorithm lives were great lives are different now you're mm -hmm. not going to go live and have Thousands. I mean, I would go live and have four or five thousand people on this live. Wow, that doesn't happen anymore. That's you know? crazy. And but now you've got functions like reels and things that are pushing out your content. So I wouldn't say what worked then necessarily is exactly what to do now. But how did, what I'm curious is how did you take that live and convert it to sales and mm -hmm. distributors? What so, was the process? Yeah. So I would go live. I'd be showcasing the products, always having call to actions. If you're interested in this yeah. makeup, if you're interested DM in me this or, or drop something in the chat, message me. I was doing a lot of attraction marketing at the time, doing different posts, whether it was with the makeup or just kind of what the industry is providing for me and my little one. I mean, that was a big, big season of my life that I talked about a lot. And so I would get messages after the live and I would stay up. I would end the live around 10 o'clock. And I would stay up till I'm not proud of this, but sometimes two in the morning, just You're grinding, answering messages. Yeah, because I mean, that was my quiet time. Mm -hmm. 
And because once my baby would wake up, we do it all over again. Mm -hmm. And so I worked really late at night. I also found that if you respond to people, now you can't respond to everybody right away, but when they message you, they're interested in that moment. And so if you can guide them through that conversation from start to finish right away versus message you today, I'll get back to you tomorrow. And it's this ping pong game. I was landing these cells very quickly. Mm. And so fast forward to the next year of just showing up constantly. Well, for, for, before we get to the next year. So you leave the conference, go home, you know, like, what did you make this month, that next month, next month, next month? I mean, what was the progression of, of uh, income approximately? I would say at the time that I left that conference, if I, if I had to take an educated guess, I was probably making 2,500 a month. Mm -hmm. When I was doing these lives, I don't know how quickly it was progressing, but I remember getting to about 4,000 a month pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, like this is, it's not a lot in the grand scheme of things, but it's enough to provide. Um, and then I remember getting my first five figure paycheck pretty quickly. And I, I bawled, I just cried. I mean, that was, that was a huge turning point for me. And that had to have been probably about a year and a half into the business. So a year after that conference. Got it. So you finally get, finally get to, you know, uh, over $10,000 in a month. Yeah. And, and that it's was like, whoa. Ha, yeah. That was huge. That was and, huge. And were you through the divorce at this time? Yes, would have been through the divorce at that time. And so I had moved back home. So I have to ask a divorce question. Did, did he, <laughs> did he uh, ever ask you for support from you, you no. being successful in your business? No, not at all. Oh, that's good. No, not that's at good. all. I mean, it happens. Yeah. That's the only reason why I ask. When things flip sometimes, yeah. it happens. Yeah. So great. No, not at all. He was, he was always very supportive. Um, so yeah, so at this point, I'm, I moved back home. Now, I lived on my own with my daughter but we were in the same town as my parents and just, just hustling, mm -hmm. you know? And I know people hate that word, but it's like that. I, I'm a firm believer in that word. Yeah. I mean, if you want to make something happen, you have to hustle, you have to put in the late night hours and you got to do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. And so that was a huge turning point. So kind of a cool moment is next conference. So a year later, I ended up getting to walk the stage as the number one seller in the wow. company and number two recruiter. Wow. And so I, again, one year I, after the decision, one year after the decision. Man, so it remarkable. It moved pretty quick. Yeah. But again, it was just that decision of like, I got to make this happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I showed up every day and I will say I've got a lot of flaws, but one thing I, you know, I tell my team and I tell people that I'm proud of is for the last seven years, I've been extremely consistent. Mm. I've not had a moment where I've walked away or a season I've taken. I mean, for seven years, I've been consistent. Yeah, I and love I think that. that's key. Love that. Hey there, just a quick interruption, especially for network marketers. Whether you're just starting out or if you're ready to level up, GoPro Academy has just what you need to take your network marketing business to the next level. Get step-by-step -step training on how to get started or restarted the right way, and then get everything you need to earn six figures or more and become a network marketing pro. To learn more, just visit goproacademy.com. I've helped millions of people learn how to recruit, tens of thousands of people to reach six figures, and I've personally helped more than a thousand people achieve seven figure incomes and above in network marketing. I can help you too. Head to goproacademy.com today, and I'll see you there. All right, so, from there, did it keep progressing? Was, it did. It just like, was there an, ever any drama, trauma in your growth curve or was it just kind of a steady seven year climb? No, it was ups and downs. Uh, so from there, again, going back to being a perfectionist, I was like, okay, I was number one seller, number two recruiter. I'm going to go get number one in both. <laughs> yep. So I worked even harder and it wasn't, I'm not competitive. All this from the person who just wants to be a mom. I know. I know. And that's what's so funny about my story. I look back and I said, I would never be career driven, but I found my passion in it, mm -hmm. you know, and I was still passionate about being a mom. What, what did you like most about it? I've always loved to challenge myself. So, I mean, even looking back in high school, I did not grow up doing dance, but I remember seeing this one dance performance and thought, I want to be on the dance team. 
But it was never enough for me. I thought, no, I want to be captain of the dance team. Although all these girls have been dancing since they were three, I've danced for six months. You know, I just, I always had that, I think, ingrained in me. Mm -hmm. My dad was always a very hard worker and he always challenged himself. So I think I got a lot of that from him. Yeah, but, uh, but I'm sensing competitive. With myself. Yeah. Well, you also want to be number one and beat somebody else. I mean, valid. That's valid. Yeah. Yeah. So it's okay. I mean, yeah. competition's not bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a good tool. I think I just like to like prove to myself that I can do it. Right. You know? And so, and again, I've had to let some of that go over the years because it can get unhealthy. Yeah. You know, it can be a good thing, but then it can also. Give me an example of unhealthy that, that in your personal experience. When did you go, you know what? This is too much. I, I got to pull it back. So there was, it was, I'll, I'll never forget. It was September of 2018. I was pushing to break my sales record. I was pushing to break all. I mean, and, and at this time I was growing a team, leading a team, but I was still very focused on the, that personal growth. And that's what I'm so thankful for with my first company is I learned a lot personally. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, I was dead set on, I'm going to break this record. I sold $42,000 personally in one month of makeup products, but I was so burnt out. Mm. I don't even know if burnt out is the right word. I was just, I had this breakdown of like, I mean, I was working tirelessly. The whole point of why I started this to be with my daughter. I'm like, you know, on the phone while she's, you know, like it, You're losing I lost it all because I got caught up in just the chasing the next thing and chasing the next goal. And I don't think it's a bad thing to have bigger goals, but you also have to learn how to be content along the way mm. with what you have. Mm. And I had found myself not being content with 20,000 in sales and 30,000 in sales. And well, the sky's the limit with my paycheck. So let me go more and more and more and more. And I got to the point where I just had a breakdown and I was at my mom's house and like crying, like I can't do this anymore. Like I'm, I'm, I'm doing well in this area, but I'm not a good friend. I'm not being a good daughter. I'm not being the best mother I can be. Like I really lost the myself. Guilt kicks in that in. Time. It did. I wasn't even looking back, even just self-care, like I would work so late that I would be so exhausted. I would go to bed without washing my face. I would just sleep, get up next day, do it all again. I was not eating health. I mean, I just really lost myself during that time. Yep. So to everybody else watching, it's like, wow, she's top seller and sold this, you know, you're holding it together by string. Oh know? yeah. And it, and it broke, it mm. broke that month. And that's when I thought, okay, never again. So what was the pivot? What, what, what changes did you make in order to be able to feel like you're more healthy in the grind? I think first off, I had to work on just little small things like personal care, like wash your face at night, start going to the gym. I wouldn't go to the gym because that's work time, right? Like that's time I could be Who was watching the, the baby at, the, at this time? Myself. Uh, myself but, yeah like going to how do you go to the gym with your child care they have okay, child care there. at the gym okay, okay. yeah if you want to but go you, were you at the, with your parents would your mom help out so? yeah they would help out some so my mom got into real estate at that time so she was pretty busy my dad still i mean mm -hmm. he's a fire chief today so he's you know they still had their jobs and they would my they they were great they would mm -hmm. help out when they could but she was still with me day to day um but i think because you can work from your phone and because yeah it's easy to get lost in that. Yeah. You know? So I just had to start making so those self care small changes. was one piece. Self care I'm gonna work was one out. Piece. I'm gonna I'm gonna wash my face before I go to bed, <laughs> you know, that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Um and be, then, kind, be kind to yourself a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And then pulling back on work a little bit. And I and I think for me again, always Was it was it pulling back or is, or was it um being more efficient in the time you gave it? You know, like putting some boundaries That's around true. it. Like, yeah. yeah, I'm going to work these hours, but you know, you know what? Phone's turning off here and I'm going to yeah. check in for dinner. I'm going to check in yeah. for playtime or whatever. I think boundaries is what I had to put in place because I was a 24 seven like service bar of yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you message me, I'll answer right then, you know, because I always thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to lose this cell. Mm -hmm. Well, in reality, people, you might, you might, you, you lose may. it one here or there, but you I mean, you, you, you do need to have a life. Exactly. So I had to set boundaries in place. I was like, okay, I'm not working till 2 a.m. Maybe I work till midnight, <laughs> maybe not 2 a.m. And just started to get myself on a schedule. So it was a lot of small things that added up. But I was like, I've got to. And honestly, I had to have a life too outside. Yeah. I'm like, I need to go find some friends. <laughs> right. I need to. Friends, you know, were you dating involved. at the time? Anything? No, I was not dating at the time. Just me and my daughter and my phone. <laughs> Your daughter and phone. So yeah. I, I think it's interesting, this whole discussion, because I'm entrepreneurially minded 
Yeah. Marina is as well. Uh, so, you know, we don't have any problem talking about business all the time. We don't have any problem uh, doing all this stuff all the time. We, we can set some boundaries here or there, but, uh, I struggle saying no mm -hmm. when I need to. Um, yeah. I think so, I, I heard somebody say you know, it, it either needs to be a hell yes or a hell no. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty right. It's just like that eh, in between. It's a no. Yeah. Um, and at the beginning, uh, other people's time was more valuable than mine. So I was willing to invest the time, sacrifice the time in order to be able to earn. Right. Do what I needed to do. And eventually my time became more and more valuable. And then I, I needed to walk away from the, the limiting beliefs of the early stages and start to say, you know, no, it's got to fit in this window. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm not going to do it here. I, I need a day there. Those types of things. I still work, work on that. Yeah. Um, cause contribution is an awful lot of fun. Helping other people is yeah. an awful lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, finding that balance, figuring all that stuff out, um, as a young, young woman, uh, mm -hmm. finding her way in the world. Yeah. I, I, I'm of the belief that I think single women are like literal superheroes. Sing, <laughs> single moms yeah. are, I don't know how they do it, honestly, yeah. uh, to, to run a business, take care of a, a, a little one, many without any support at all. Uh, I mean, I, my head would blow off my shoulders. Yeah. Uh, you know, men, I don't, I don't know if, I know there's, there's uh, single dads out there too, yeah. but wow. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a challenge to be able to do that. So finding that and, and thank God you can have something that you could do from your phone. Yeah. For I real. mean, think of all the business you couldn't use just with your smartphone. Yeah. Think of, you know, things you couldn't go live. You couldn't reach out. You'd have to go and do home parties or some, something like that. Yeah. Leave the house, uh, go to an office, yeah. check in somewhere, commute. Yeah. Uh, all of these things that add up all these hours that, that start to take away from your focus. Right. Yeah. Um, so through all this, you're building a career, you're doing all this stuff. Uh, it's interesting, the whole friend conversation, mm -hmm. because it's a, it's, we, we make so many friends inside of our business, right? Yeah. And there are spirit animals. You know, these, these are the people that we like, we're like these people. We know these people. Uh, you know, I talk with people sometimes it's like, ah, you know, I, I don't have the, patience like i'm gonna go hang out with somebody and just like talk about nonsense it doesn't you know why I, I i don't get it so this process of developing friendships and it's interesting because you know especially when you make some money mm -hmm. finding friends that aren't in your business sometimes can be a little refreshing okay. uh break Sometimes you go talk about different things, do yeah. different things, and there's not agendas attached, you know, when they're part of your team or those yeah. types of things. Sometimes it's good when you find cross-line friends inside of your business yeah. instead of upline, downline. Um, but, you know, what was that process of, uh, of making some friends and what, and, and did you ever start dating or you just magically, your husband just knocked on the door <laughs> or what? Yeah. So I did, I did start with the online dating apps. Yes. And met him through an app called Bumble. Uh -huh. Well, you reach out first. You do. And what's interesting is I hadn't been on the app for very long. And, you know, you swipe, swipe right if you're interested, swipe left if you're not. And I would get all these matches and I would never actually message anybody because it just was weird. I'm like, what do you even say? Hi, like, Hi. how Hello. are you? I don't know you. And there was one day that I was on the app and, and I don't remember it's, it's been a while, but there was something about his picture that was highlighted different than everybody else's. And I was new to this app. So I'm like, what does this mean? And come to find out, it means that they've extended another 24 hours for you to message them because if you don't message them within 24 hours, it goes away. Mm. And so I was like, okay, this guy must really want me to message him because he extended the time. So long story short, I messaged him. We met up halfway. Where did he live? How far did he live away? Uh, he was in Tyler, Texas. I was in Abilene at the time. So we met up in Dallas. That was okay. like the halfway point. So we met up and it was really funny too, because when I met him, one of the things he told me, he said, I'm a very private guy. I don't put my life out there. And I was like, okay, like this, this is going to be interesting because I kind of put my life out there. Yeah. You know, I'm doing everything on social media. Um, but we hit it off right away and started dating. Um, and that, 
for me because I, I was starting to form friends at the time too, but not as quickly as I had hoped. I had I had done so much from home sure. and on my phone. You so, meet people at the gym, you meet people at church, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I would talk to people, but I still didn't have this core group of friends that I hung out with. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would hang out with my parents a bunch and go mm -hmm. to church, meet people, come back home, work, and then talk to, and then I started talking to him. So that took up a whole lot of my time and interest. Yeah. So I started talking to him and that was refreshing because I remember having days where we would just text constantly for hours and I wasn't working and it was refreshing to mm -hmm. just have somebody to talk to. He had no connection to network marketing you know, didn't have anybody in his family that was in network marketing. So. What did he think of your adventure when, when he, he learned about it? Yeah. So he he's always been pretty supportive. And I think part of that is because when we started dating, I already had success in this industry. Mm -hmm. So when I invited him to his first company conference, I wanted him to come and just kind of get a feel for what I do. He it was a whole new world to him because at this point, you know, I'm one of the top ones in the company and, you know, I know a lot of people. So he got to kind of see me in my element. He got to see me train. So I feel like he was a believer from the get go mm -hmm. because he just kind of was thrown into that. What does he, what does he do? So he has a degree in business marketing um, and design technology. Mm -hmm. So he works in an engineering office. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, he was here in Vegas at, he's here right now, yeah. but, uh, at, at this mastermind with you. Uh, and he's been, been here for a few times. Uh, what, what's his take about like our high level discussions about, you know, serious network marketing. Success? Yeah. How, no. how, you know, how, how does he absorb all that stuff? Yeah. So first off, he is the most supportive person I could ask for. And mm. that's what I prayed for. I was like, okay, Lord, if you're going to give me somebody, like it's going to have to be somebody who's really supportive of this industry of what I do, the time I spend. Um, and he, he loves it. Like our conversations at night in bed are about network marketing are about what we can do or about, and he's my cheerleader. I mean, even talking, when I talked with you with mastermind, mm -hmm. he was the one, when I got off the phone with you, and I was like, okay, we, you know, here it all is. He's like, I think you should do it. And I'm the one over here, like, mm. I don't know. And he's always been so supportive in that area. I mean, he was taking his own notes yesterday. And when we got home or to the hotel, we're just chatting about things that we can implement for our team. So I think he really sees and understands the potential in this industry mm -hmm. and the potential of, yes, I've had success, but we're just beginning to scratch the surface. He sees that. Right. He pushes me. He comes up with ideas for our team. He's got that engineering sure, mind. So, so he can structure some stuff, systems. Yeah, yeah. He's got the Excel spreadsheets. He's like messaging me like, hey, did you know your team does this on average every hour? And I'm like, cool. Like I'm just, I want to do right. the content, the creative. So it's a really great supportive like support system you've been doing this for eight years now seven eight years seven years seven years and um can you say what your best year was income wise is that possible yeah yeah what my, was it? my best year income wise uh in one month my highest month was sixty two thousand in one month yeah um and i believe that year i made somewhere between six hundred and seven hundred thousand you believe it it no i don't it still feels weird to like say it out loud yeah. Six or seven hundred thousand. Um, so, what what's changed in your lifestyle as far as you know? Do you is do you do you are you fancy? Do you do fancy? You know, stuff? I do. I mean, I I like to dress up. I like fashion. I like things like that. But I don't know if we're just a rare breed in the sense that we we joke about this all the time. We have always been savers. Good. And investors is better, but yeah. Yeah, that's probably a better word. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you know, we we don't try to live beyond our means by any mean. Um, we do. It is nice to not have to budget things. I remember, you know, when I first moved away from home, I was doing the Dave Ramsey, the envelopes, putting cash in the envelopes. If you spent your entertainment fund, that was it. You know, you don't go see a movie. You don't go out to eat. And so and, and that was great. I learned a lot during that time. It is nice, though, to be able to make decisions in life without having to sit down and pinch pennies and mm -hmm. figure out where it's coming from. And so I do when when they say the word, the phrase financial freedom, like I feel that mm -hmm. like I feel that for our family. We're not you know, we want to put our kids in a great school and they're in a great school that we love yep. that without this career, they wouldn't be in that school. Right. You know, so I look at it differently. You know, I'm I've never been one like. 
I don't need the yachts. I don't need all the fancy. I just want to live a lifestyle that's comfortable where yeah. we're stress-free. My husband and I, we love to travel. 2023, we traveled every month, but one month. Wow. Those kind of things, yeah. you know, that make it, make it worthwhile. What do you think is your superpower? What, what, what's, uh, separated you from other people that had similar circumstance, similar yeah. situations, and they weren't making the sales. They weren't building the teams. They're frustrated. They're trying to figure it out. What did you figure out? Do you think if you're going to like step out of yourself and look at yourself, what makes you special? Mm -hmm. What separates you from other people, even inside your own company? Yeah, I would say there's maybe a few parts to this. Um, first one we kind of touched on, but I think finally figuring out how to tap into that authenticity and not be the perfect person and say all the right things. I think when I finally showed up online, just being real and raw, I think that separated me apart because there are still people, you know, today trying to get on live, make sure they know everything about their product just perfectly or the comp plan just perfectly. And I got to a point where I mean, I would, I mean, I have blonde moments. I butcher words online and I began to embrace that and like, just not make fun of myself, but learn to laugh at myself, mm -hmm. learn to Don't take yourself fun. so yeah. seriously. And I think people felt connected and still feel connected and drawn to that. I mean, I would, I, I'd say one of the biggest compliments I ever got was recently and I was at an incentive trip, um, with the company I'm with. And this girl came up to me. She was brand new in the company. She earned the trip. And she said, I just got to tell you, I've been looking forward to meeting you. She said, I asked around at who was like the most real authentic person here. And she's like, people just kept throwing your name out. And she's like, I just had to come meet you. And I was like in tears because I'm like that. That's a big compliment to yeah. me. I want to be real. I don't want to put on this persona that I have everything figured out because I don't. It's interesting that there's a balance, though. Um because if you're authentic and you're a hot mess <laughs> and you don't give anybody a way out, you're yeah. just a train wreck. Nobody wants to join you. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So you need to be authentic, but hopeful. Right. Authentic, but optimistic. Yeah. Authentic, but you know what? We're going to figure it out. Yeah. Authentic, not taking yourself so seriously, but, you know, they're going to see pre-makeup and post-makeup. And they go, oh, okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That looks different. Yeah. But, you know, I relate to both of them. Yeah. So uh, be careful that you're just not so authentic that you're, you're a downer. Yeah. For everybody. For sure. It's like, man, I'm having a hard day. It's okay to have tears. It's okay to right. have it. But, but like, damn it, I'm going to pick myself up. Yeah. They need to hear the damn it. Yeah. I'm going to pick myself up. I'm going to change this. I'm going to yeah. do that. I'm going to, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to get for mad. Sure. Uh, that kind of thing. So you found that balance. I think so. I mean, I was never, and even to this day, I was even going through the adversity. I was never getting on live and just crying my eyes out and woke. Not that kind of, I don't. You weren't victim-y. No, not yeah. at all. If anything, it was like, you know what? My situation is not ideal, mm -hmm. but I think we have the choice to frame our situation. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we can frame it in a way that's woe is me. Look at what has happened or here's what I've learned from this. And here's what this story can do for me. You know, I think of the story of Paul in the Bible, you know, he goes to Rome to preach the gospel and he winds up in prison. I mean, that's about as, <laughs> that's about as bad as it gets. Mm -hmm. And he ended up writing, it wasn't, woe is me. Maybe this wasn't my purpose. Why am I here? It, he said that, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically in so many words, he was grateful because now he said, I'm locked up to these guards who I get to preach the gospel to for eight hours. They're rotating and I'm going to advance the gospel. And so he took this situation and that's always been so inspiring to me is you know, yeah, my situation was not ideal, but I'm really thankful for it. 100%. Really thankful for it. And so I think even going online and being vulnerable with people, I think they found hope in my story because it wasn't just look at look at what's happened to me. It's like, you know what? This is not great, but look how the Lord can use this. And they found hope in their story. So I agree. When you're authentic, there is a there's still a balance of that. Mm -hmm. And then tactically, because like you said, you can't just be authentic and have people 
you know, just piling and knocking on your door. I do think I dug in and I did research and I studied. And one of my strengths is social media Mm -hmm. and training. I love training. I love teaching people that teaching people, social, anything really. Mm -hmm. But I would say I, I do feel like in the last year or so, I feel like I've kind of cracked a little bit of the code of social media. I don't think you ever fully cracked the code of social media. It's always changing, but the principles do. Right, right. And so I feel like I have found success in that. So it moved into network marketing. Look at what it's done for me to, okay, I've, I've experienced that. And now I want other single moms. I want other moms. I want other women to experience what I've experienced. So now my passion has shifted from, okay, what can I do? And Mm -hmm. I still struggle with that. I Mm -hmm. still am an Mm -hmm. overachiever, but now how can I help these women achieve the same thing? And so I tell my team all the time, you join or people who are about to join, you join with me. I'm not giving you fluff. I'm not giving you brave heart, motivational speeches. I'm giving you the tactical tools that you need to grow a business. And so you pair the authenticity with the knowledge and the things I bring to the table. And I think that's why over the years I've been able to. I like it. So many. Um, let me ask you just some rapid fire. Yeah. Um, data questions. H- how big is your team approximately? So the company I'm with, I'll be with two years in April mm-hmm. and we have about 1600 on the team. 1600. How many different lines of sponsorship do you have? So my front line I've recruited 320 people. 320. So it goes okay. very wide. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and uh, any six-figure earners on your team? Not yet. Not yet, but it's coming up. It's coming up. All right. Yes. Um, the authenticity, properly framed, teaching, mm-hmm. duplication, growing the team. Is it is it expanded geographically? Is it mostly in one spot? Is it? All over the place? Where is it? I would say we're a little bit of all over because I, I've done so much on social media and not locally in person, which I'm branching off into that. Mm-hmm. But we're kind of a little all over the United States. Right now, we're just in the US, so we've not gone to other countries yet. But we've got a lot of girls from the South. We've got a lot of Southern girls yeah. in the United States. What's the most you can imagine? We went through this exercise a couple of days ago. The most you can imagine in a month that you'll give yourself permission to imagine. Yeah. I think a goal for us that we can see that we know is possible right now is a hundred thousand a yeah. month. Yeah. I, I've, I've heard a phrase and I think it's true. Pretty true. Is that all a person can really imagine is about twice what they've their, their best month ever was. And that would be pretty valid. Pretty close. Yeah. You know, close. so if you're making, you know, $10 an hour, you can, you can see 20, right. 40 seems like too much, right? but you know, if you're $40 yeah. an hour, you can see 80. Yeah. Um, so I think that's generally true. But but again, as soon as you get to the 100, you're going to realize there's another level. Yeah. And if if I could go back, not that I've ever go back and, and change anything because I like where my life is and all that stuff. But if I was to give anybody else advice of what they could do now, this moment, is give yourself permission to think bigger earlier. Mm-hmm. Because if you if you just open that door, and permission's an important word, you open that door and just let yourself think about that yeah. without guilt, without fear, without doubt, without any of that stuff. Just let that sink in and then think about, all right, what would I have to do to make that happen? And challenging all your limiting beliefs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, think if you started that a little earlier, mm-hmm. if you started at 100 a little earlier, that yeah. was, that was the, the focus. Uh, you know, maybe the path would be a little different. Yeah. You know, th- and, and it's not any one big thing that gets you there. Right. It's a thousand all little 1% things. things. All For these sure. tiny little micro decisions. I'm going to do this. I'm going to say, no, I'm turning my phone off here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to work. Mom is going to work during this time. Yeah. Uh, you know, date nights and all the other kind of stuff yeah. to, to keep your relationship strong. Do you have more kids now? We do. How, yeah. how many kids do you have? We have three. Girl, boy, girl. She, My oldest just turned eight. My boy just turned three. And we have an almost two-year-old. Oh, wow. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you got a busy house. Yeah, we have our own challenges now that sure. are different. Sure. You know? But, yeah. yeah, it's very busy. Very oh, busy. Too fun. What's next for you? What do you, what do you think is your next uh, challenge, adventure? What, what's the next chapter look like? Yeah, I think for me right now I'm really focused on – 
finding systems and things to duplicate mm -hmm. what I've done. Mm -hmm. I think it's easy to tell somebody like we talked about, oh, go live and do this and show your face. But what are those things going to look like for people to actually be able to do those things? Like, is it written down? Is it in video format? And so right now, that's where my focus is, is how can I take what I've learned and break it down in bite size for people to be able to duplicate? So focus is really on that, building those six and seven figure earners. Sure. And I mean, our team is new. Our team is new and it's growing. We're one of the fastest growing teams in the company and um, we're on the leaderboards and things like that. And I, that's my passion is mm -hmm. just, I got to walk the stages. I got to do those things and I'm very proud of those things, but there's nothing better than this last conference I was at seeing 30 plus of your teammates walk the stage. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's where my passion lies. And again, going back to that dream of when I was 17 and public speaking and being able to, it's funny how it moved from, okay, my personal growth. Now I want to help my team. Well, now I'm going to do some corporate trainings and I want to help the company to now I want to help people in this industry right. because this industry changed my life. I mean, I, I don't, one of the ladies here at Mastermind asked all of us at our round table, where would you, where do you think you would be without this industry? And I'm like, I don't even want to think about that. I don't know. I don't know where I would be. I don't know what I'd be doing. And because of how much it's impacted my life, like that's my passion going forward. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't stop talking about it. Right. You know? Right. So growing up, leaving school, the dream was be a wife, be a mom. Mm -hmm. That was the dream. Mm -hmm. What's the dream now? If you were just wife and mom, that's all you got to do. Yeah. How fulfilled would you feel? Um, or would you feel like there's something missing? I will say my 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 family does fulfill. I'm not a I'm not saying it doesn't. Piece. Uh, yeah. Obviously a big piece. Right. But would you feel like there was, you know, something yeah. missing in your in your Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Because I'm always talking to my husband about he's he's so supportive because I'm the dreamer. I'm the one who's like, okay, now I want to write a book. And now he's I the do engineer. This. He's going to yeah. like map it out. Yeah. And so I'm always dreaming bigger on how I can help more people and how I can scale this business for myself, for my family, build a legacy brand that exceeds far beyond when I'm here. Contribution is something. Isn't yeah. It? You know, uh, uh, accumulation is one thing and it's important and security and safety and predictability and right. opportunities for your family and all that. Um, but once you get that done, it's, there's not a lot of fulfillment just in that. Yeah. When you flip into contribution. Yeah. Contribution to your kids, contribution yeah. to your family, contribution to your community or your church or right. those types of things or or in helping other people. Yeah. To to break free. Yeah. Like you did. And I feel like, I do feel like the Lord has me in a place where, yes, I get my fulfillment from being a mom and a wife. But through all of this experience, he's shown me that I have a purpose that goes beyond that. Yep. And when I originally started my podcast, it was called Building an Eternal Business. Hmm. Because for me, it's so much more than, yes, I want, I want people to find financial freedom. I want people to be able to reach their goals and their dreams. But I also know at the end of the day, we're not taking any of it with us. Nope. None of it. And so for me, it goes beyond, we're not just building an earthly business, we're building an eternal business, something that we can leave a legacy with. So for me, that's kindness, positivity, pouring the love of Jesus into people like that. That's why I don't think I can ever rest at this point. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, it's mission, yeah, mission driven. It's bigger, it's bigger. And so I'm always dreaming bigger. I'm always trying to figure out what more we can do. Yeah, love that so much. Pressure. Well, listen, I, I appreciate you coming in and sharing the story. I mean, to go from a struggle and insecurity and doubt and fear yeah. and finding your way out one yeah. little live at a time. Yeah. One little after the baby went to bed, it took a few hours every night mm -hmm. and and built a business, mm -hmm. you know, found a, a company to partner with. And not only do you build success, but now you're helping other people do the same. Yeah. So it, it can become a form of ministry, right? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. yeah, the ability to be a blessing to people yeah. and show them how they can feel better about their, their purpose when it comes to opportunity, when it comes to income, when it comes to connection with other people in a positive way. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming in. I really Thank appreciate it. Um, 
and I'm sure everybody's <laughs> going to get value. I appreciate it. So that's my conversation with Kristen Vance. I hope you got value from it. If you did, please make sure you forward this to a friend, somebody that you know might be in a situation where this information can help them see a better future. All right, do that. I appreciate it. Thanks for helping spread the word and go out there and make today amazing. See you next time.